So thank you for joining us. I'm Patricia Rosenmeyer, Faculty Director of the Carolina Center for Jewish Studies, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Emerging Scholars Talk with our very own Oscar Chenza. We started the Emerging Scholars Talk Scholars Series in the fall of 2020 as a way to introduce Carolina graduate students and their research to the greater community. These online talks are usually based on the students' dissertation research, and because our students and faculty work in such a wide range of subfields in Jewish studies, I think this series really exemplifies the breadth of scholarship that's taking place on campus. If you missed past Emerging Scholars talks, you can view them on the Center's YouTube channel. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to make sure you all know about our March 2nd celebration, the 20th anniversary celebration, which will feature a reception and a jazz performance with Israeli musician Daniel Zamir. I do hope you can join us and event details are on our website. All these events are made possible through generous gifts to the center. Everything we do at the center is made possible because of the support of alumni and friends. So if you'd like more information on how you can contribute to the center and help us meet our mission, please visit us at jewishstudies.unc.edu. So we're delighted to welcome Oscar Chenza here tonight. And uh, Oscar is a PhD candidate in the Department of History and one of our center's Tau Epsilon Phi graduate student fellows in Jewish studies. His research interests include the cultural and social history of Jews in East Central Europe, the Jewish immigrant experience in the US and Yiddish culture. His research has been supported by various institutions in addition to our center, such as the Center for Jewish History in New York and the American Academy for Jewish Research. Tonight's talk is titled, A Galician Wedding, Yiddish Popular Culture and Regionalism in American Jewish Immigrant Life, 1910 to 1938. And Are after, you gonna watch it? And after the talk, um, we'll have a brief question and answer period. I'd ask you to please put your questions in the chat section at the bottom of the screen. Um, and if you could keep your mics off because we are recording the event. So please join me in welcoming Oscar Chenze. Thank you, Patricia, for this kind introduction. And also thank you for the Carolina Center of Jewish Studies for organizing this series. And also thank you all for uh, joining us on Zoom. I will start sharing now my screen. I will also go back to the first slide. So before I take you today to the New York's Lower East Side and into the world of Yiddish popular culture, let me first start with a map of contemporary Europe and the region of Galicia. Um, when we talk today about the region of Galicia, we have the very confusing situation that there is an actual functioning administrative region called with the name Galicia, but in Spain on the left side of the map. And as beautiful as Spain is, um, I am more interested in the historical region of Galicia, which is here to the right. It's today in southeastern Poland, and western Ukraine. And it was the historic province of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It appeared first on the maps in 1772, and it lasted for only around 150 years until the dissolution of the Austrian Empire at the end of the First World War in 1918. And if you know the two major cities, it was Krakow and Lviv. And despite its short existence, the region of Galicia did not disappear from the mental maps of many Jews who emigrated from this province in the late 19th, early 20th century. And this is the topic of my larger dissertation project, but I just want to briefly introduce to you before zooming into more detail of the aspect of Yiddish popular culture. So in my dissertation, which is entitled Galicia on Our Mind, the role of regionalism in New York's Jewish immigrant community from 1890 to 1938, I discuss three spaces of everyday life where Jews engage with different forms of regionalism and regional identities. One is the family life, including religious and work communities, but also tourism, heritage trips to Eastern Europe in the 1920s and 30s. 
The second dimension are social institutions, such as mutual aid societies, so-called Landsmannschaften, but also relief work after the First World War. And the third dimension is Yiddish popular culture, which is the topic of today's talk, where Galician Jews reacted to and created regional stereotypes in newspapers, in the theater, and in music. So today I will discuss first the role of regionalism in New York's immigrant neighborhood, and second, to what extent Yiddish press and theater created and mobilized regional belonging throughout the interwar period. I will ask you the following questions. How did the culture wars between various regional groups, such as Galicianer, Galician Jews, and the Litvaks, Lithuanian, Russian Jews, emerge? And what can Yiddish popular culture tell us about the nature of American Jewry after the First World War? In American Jewish culture, New York's immigrant neighborhood, the Lower East Side, holds an almost mythical place, often referred to as the birthplace of American Jewry. It's an image that had been meticulously crafted already in early 20th century. And I do not attempt to recreate this myth in this talk. There were many other places in North and South America where Jewish immigrants found a home and settled in. But I, I would like to invite you to explore this neighborhood with me from the perspective of a social experiment. In 1905, around 350,000 Jews from different cultural backgrounds and different regions in Eastern Europe lived in a very small condensed area. Unlike in Eastern Europe, where miles of roads and tracks separated Jews, in this neighborhood, it was difficult to pass a street without encountering a different dialect, a different style of clothing, different sounds, or even smells. This chaos and distress of regional cultures resulted in the pattern of settling with people from the same place, as you can see on this map to the right. We have here in blue, for example, a Romanian quarter. Inside the Romanian quarter, we have a Levantine quarter. In orange, we have the Galician quarter. In yellow, the Russian quarter. And you can see a close up of the space on the left side in a contemporary map of New York for everyone who. Uh, knows uh, the New York landscape. And the borders between those settlements, they were much more fluid than the map suggests on the right. But we can say that the Galician Jews congregated in the area between Houston and Delancey Street, especially alongside Attorney Street, where the synagogues were placed. And I would like you to take you now on a walk through the free marked neighborhoods on the right map. Or let's better say I will use the perspective of a Russian Jewish intellectual here. In the satirical newspaper, The Groyser Kundes, The Big Stick from 1909, we can read a fictional story of a Russian Jew who gives a speech in three different neighborhoods in one evening. First, he goes to the Galician Quarter. In the Galician Quarter, he says, my heart is suffering when I hear my people, the Litvaks, talking about the Galicianer, how terrible, how malicious, but I, I will tell you the truth. Without the Galiziana, we would not have any Yiddish literature and drama. You are the finest of the Jewish people. Then he goes to the Romanian quarter. We are all the same. But tell me, can you really compare the Romanian Jew with a Galiziana or a Litvak? Galiziana are a disgrace of our people, in vessels, beggars, and the Litvaks, not much better. You Romanian Jews, you invented the Yiddish theater. You are the pride of our people. Then he goes to the final neighborhood in the Russian quarter. Brothers and sisters, apologies for the delay. I discovered this evening that we Russian and Lithuanian Jews, we are the most intelligent, the best and the prettiest. We need to tell the world that Galiziana and Romanian Jews are no Jews and had never been Jews. So why the author of the satirical story reveals in a playful way the nonsensical nature of the cultural wars between the groups Depending on your kinship, everyone can claim that they are the smartest and most cultured one. But it leaves also the reader with a bitter note. The Russian Jew in this story is basically denying Galicians and Romanians the right to be Jews, members of the community, while playing the fine and open-minded intellectual in front of them. It is, seen, it is a scene that not only played out in fiction, but also in real life, in the streets and the shops of the Lower East Side as letters by immigrants to newspapers, such as the Bindle Brief column and the forwards illustrate. 
Often they led to serious doubts about oneself belonging to a larger Jewish immigrant community, but also about one's own understanding as a Jew. As a Jew, for example, from Galicia, what does it mean to be a Galiciana? What does it mean to be a Litvak? And as I discovered in my research, these regional stereotypes, the Galiciana in my case, did not emerge from within the Galician Jewish community. Neither, it was a, neither was it a specific tradition that the immigrants themselves carried over from Europe. They were a product of popular culture, like newspapers, theater, a culture that was created within the immigrant milieu where cultural anxieties were omnipresent. And in contrast to other cities in the United States, New York was the only one that developed a very robust Yiddish popular culture scene, mostly because of this unique and ethnic and social composition in the immigrant neighborhood that I just uh, showed you. While Jews who defined themselves as culturally Russian were especially active in the world of newspapers, Galician Jewish culture figures had their stronghold in the world of theater and music in New York. Here they engage with cultural stereotypes, just like the newspapers, but with an important difference. Galician Jews aimed to educate and soften the cultural anxieties of its Jewish immigrant audience. The author Anshel Shor was born in Zlochov in Galicia, today is a law chief in Ukraine, and emigrated to the United States in 1900. Together with the composer Josef Rumschiski, he staged one of the first Yiddish musical comedies, Dos Mädel von der West, The Girl from the West, between 1910 and 1912. In this song, and you can see here the cover of the sheet music, Litvak und Galicianer, um, it became soon a classic uh, of the Yiddish stage. He illustrates the daily struggle of an immigrant uh, to understand each other's dialects. And I would like now to play you the second part of the song in a version by Jacob Jacobs and Anna Hoffman from 1918. And you can follow the text uh, on the next slide, which I will show you here, but also please pay attention to the music. And now fingers crossed this will work. So on the one side, we can see here uh, the playful humor based on different Yiddish dialects and misunderstandings that could result from it. So Litvak S, S versus the Galiziana Sh is crucial when asking, for example, for fish at the table and the Galiziana thinks he's getting uh, the feet from the Litvak. On the streets, Jews literally had to translate the words in their head to make any sense out of a conversation. And such misunderstandings Standings can also fuel cultural anxieties even more 
And you can hear this also in the music that is rather heavy and melancholic. On the other side, the song ends on the note of friendship. We are all equal before God, Galicianos and Litvaks. And look, God, how the people fight and quarrel. And it ends with the sentence, there should be peace, brothers, for God's sake, like a very aggressive tone at the end. And the music changes into a very fast and uplifting tune. And Shaw's message here in the songs to the immigrant audience is clear. Avoid hatred. And indeed, the culture of wars vanished, but in the light of an actual war, the First World War. Unlike other regions in Europe, Galicia suffered immensely from constantly changing fronts and occupations between the Austrian and Russian empires, which led to immense destructions of towns and villages, including essential Jewish infrastructure. You can see here on the picture to the right, the small town Husiatin with buildings demolished from artillery. Close to the end of the war, Galicia also became a playground for both Ukrainian and Polish nationalists to realize the dreams of nationhood. In November 1918, in Lemberg-Beef, was the place of a violent pogrom carried out by locals and Polish soldiers who accused Jews of collaboration with the Ukrainians. In three days, they looted shops and killed over 100 Jews. We can see here on the picture to the right Jewish refugees that are hiding in a shelter in Lviv. Reading about these events, Jewish immigrants in the United States felt an immediate danger of a vanishing Jewish world in Europe. In response to this threat of discontinuity with the past, solidarity now shifted to their friends and families across the ocean. Across different cultural and regional backgrounds, Jews organized an impressive transnational network of relief work to sustain a Jewish future in Eastern Europe. The success of this effort to help the communities in Eastern Europe resulted in a radical transformation of the meaning of the regional stereotypes from the early immigrant era. Regionalism made gradually a place for nostalgia and images of a simple and traditional but generally Jewish life in Eastern Europe, where the local characteristics do not play a significant role anymore. In the 1920s and 1930s, a myth of Eastern Europe as the new cornerstone of American Jewish life transformed regional stereotypes into purely humoristic elements of a new entertainment culture. Here, Galiziana are usually depicted in a folksy backward way as warmer, deeply religious, emotional, and also by putting sugar into everything in their cooking. Litvaks are supposed to be dry, overly intellectual, skeptical, emotional, distant, but with a sharp toxic humor and living only from potatoes and herring. Nahum Stuchkov was a prominent Yiddish playwright, actor, and linguist. His emotional dramas over broadcast radio captivated Jewish listeners weekly, as much as his commercials. Here we have the Kirsch, which was a Jewish soda company in Williamsburg in Brooklyn. And the company was a pioneer in the field of diet soda, no cap, as they called it. Originally, it was developed for diabetics in hospitals. In this scene, Stuchkov plays with the characterizations of Galiziano and Litvaks that I just mentioned, specifically the Galiziano's sugar addiction. So two older Jews are sitting on a bench in Cortona Park and doing what older Jews do. Um, Galiziano starts, oi, oi, I'm burning with thirst. Should I say it that it was from that little piece of herring that I had for lunch? Galiziano answers, on a day like this, you eat herring? Once a Litvak, always a Litvak. Stop bothering me, Litvak Schmidtvak. My son-in-law is a Galiziana and he eats more herring than me. I'm going to have a bottle of soda. Help yourself, I'll wait for you. If only I could drink soda too. It's a real shame, Reb Srimche, that now when I'm old, I've started to suffer from diabetes and I'm forbidden to touch soda. Are you a fool? Who tells you to drink soda with sugar? Drink sugar-free soda, especially made for slobs like you. Drink no cow. And Yiddish popular culture was filled at this time with these kind of humorous sketches. While here we can still find remnants of regionalism, basically the, the sugar contact, which is connected to the beet industry from Galicia, in the world of Yiddish film, theater, we can find a Hasidic trend in the war period that emptied the regions and towns from their specific local characteristics. And it left only the labels, the names of the regions and towns. We come here now to the final 
example that I have in the title of my talk, actually, A Galician Wedding, which was an operetta by Hermann Woll, uh, Galiziana Hassene, in the opening from 1928, you can read that strictly Orthodox Jews lived in their own little world in a tiny picturesque village untouched by modern civilization. It's a typical Eastern European shtetl, small town, as it was imagined in literature and films after the Holocaust, such as most prominently Anna Tevka in the musical Fiddler on the Roof. And although the Galiziana lost its connotation with the immigrant milieu, it became an old world type of figure with rabbis singing at the Shabbos table and Hasidic Jews dancing at weddings. Yiddish writers did not romanticize Jewish shtetl life in the same way as they did in the 60s and 70s. Even on the contrary, in a phenomenon that historian and literary scholar Jeffrey Chandler called anti-nostalgia, they chose to mock Hasidism and what American Jews considered a typical East European Jewish environment. So this musical comedy, A Galician Wedding, I will just retell a little bit the story. The son of a poor water carrier, Janke, which is played by the famous Yiddish actor with big sets, falls in love with Rachel, the only daughter of the wealthiest Jew in the village. Her father surprisingly agrees to a marriage, but only if Yankele goes to a yeshiva and earns a diploma. After two years, he comes back with a diploma. And as you can see here on the poster, he's also not, an, not an, only an educated person now, but his visual appearance has also drastically changed. Unfortunately, he arrives at the moment when a wedding ceremony is already taking place between his love, Rahel, and the butcher's son. After a couple of failed attempts, Yankele finally takes the courage, grabs Rahel by her arm, and marries her as a fresh rabbi himself, to the astonishment of the crowd around him. It is a musical that makes fun of the backward Galiziana Hossett that just needs to get a proper education at the yeshiva in order to take his life into his own hands to be successful and respected in the eyes of the society. As we can see in both examples, the radio commercial and the musical comedy, Yiddish writers reinvented what it means to be a Galiziana. This time, however, the regional stereotypes did not evoke any distress or provoke any identity crisis in the immigrant community. Making fun of the Galiziana like Jankele here did not offend anyone. Boosted with new confidence as American Jews, there was simply nothing one could possibly relate to anymore. By listening to the music and visiting the performances at the theater, the increasingly acculturated and economically independent Jewish immigrants, now New York residents, sometimes even US citizens, were able to feel connected to the places they came from, but from the comfort of the American home. Irish popular culture offered American Jews an opportunity to be what they consider authentic true East European Jews, but by proxy. To conclude, the depiction of the Galiziana in popular culture offers us a unique window into important transformation processes with an American jury of the interwar period. So first, it reminds us that East European Jewish culture is much more diverse and not all of our ancestors originated from a shtetl, depending on the region. Jewish life in Eastern Europe included various forms of language, customs, and traditions. Second, we have seen that this regional sense of belonging became a key force in navigating early immigrant life and also building community. At the same time, however, regionalism caused cultural anxieties in daily life and confusion. Popular culture offered here a vehicle to work through these stereotypes by educating the immigrant audience. Just like in the broader American context, popular culture brought a community tech together and gave it a new meaning. Seeing and listening to Yiddish plays and other media, Jews found comfort and stability in the new role as members of an increasingly self-conscious American Jewish community, but also of the communities they had left in Europe. The story of Jewish immigrants in the United States is not a story of loss, losing tradition, losing language, and losing culture. It's a story of reinvention and transformation. And popular culture brings here past and present together into harmony. And even today, regionalism still plays a role in American Jewish society. Heritage trips, genealogical research, and the internet offer opportunities to look back to the region one's own ancestors came from. 
the story of searching for belongings between notions of American, of Jewish and regional belongings continues. As you can see here in the internet meme, uh, sometimes old immigrant stereotypes experience a comeback. And this time it's in favor of the Galiziana. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Oscar. That was that was wonderful, informational, and entertaining. Um, <laughs> and so I encourage uh, everyone to put questions into the chat. I should then be able to see them, and I will um, be able to pass them on to Oscar. I could start with one, what people, people are thinking. Um, it was really interesting to learn how, um, how regionalism turned into nostalgia. I really enjoyed that. And, and I was interested in how different it remained in Europe, right? That that sense of <laughs> where you came from as a Jew in Europe was still very, very important and, and, and critical to identity. Whereas in America, it, uh, it changed. Um, do you have any comments on sort of that aspect of regionalism between the two wars in Europe? Um, I can just say a couple of little things about European because that's not like part of my yes. yeah. overall study, but the aspect of nostalgia is almost not present. Although the American theater plays were super popular in, in, in like Warsaw, for example, or in Bucharest, so that the companies like a Galician wedding were also shown in Eastern Europe and people went there to see it. So um, while like offers from like the European scene, like the East European Jewish scene are not engaging too much uh, with like the aspect of nostalgia, they do um, and still with the aspect of regionalism, which is much more stronger and characteristic are still there. Galicia's, uh, for Polish Jews, Galicia was like the first region where they had like administrative autonomy, uh, like the politicians are coming from their diaspora nationalism is coming from Galicia. I mean, it's also nicknamed the mother Israel, Galicia. So like the political importance of Galicia is much more important than the cultural one, for example, for Polish Jews. Um, that's that's great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I didn't mean to, to put you on the spot. I mean, <laughs> some, <laughs> some questions coming in. <laughs> so, um, so let me uh, offer the one from, from Kata. Do you know the degree to which American Galiziana engaged with cultural production being produced in Lvov and Krakow at this time, as mm -hmm. opposed to American cultural production on Galiziana? So many of the um, authors like uh, Shore or Gershon Bader, who was a writer, and even Ludwig Satz, they made travels and like um, basically participated in Lviv, not so much in Krakow, but like in Lviv or in Warsaw in their theater productions. Um, and they brought sometimes also people with them to New York. So mm -hmm. that's why we can also find in New York like actors from the same town, from the same village basically also playing in New York. There wasn't so much, as far as I can say now, there wasn't so much engagement with the actual cultural productions being produced in Eastern Europe, in Lviv or in Krakow or in Warsaw. Um, it was more like looking for inspiration and then bringing it back to the United States. So it's, it wasn't like a movement forth and back. It was more about like, let's get some new ideas, let's bring the people and then incorporate the new ideas in New York into for an immigrant audience. And maybe that's the reason why there was not that much engagement of cultural productions being produced in the East European towns, because um, the audience was the New York immigrant audience. So there was also not that much of a need to engage with the cultural productions. But we're also more in the Yiddish high culture, like tales and um, 
stories from the Bible were played for uh, Eastern Europe. If this Wonderful. answers your question, Katie. Then we have a question. Um, uh, what is Polish or is Polish a separate category? Um, this is an interesting question. Yeah. So um, Polish and Litvak was a category already in Eastern Europe and beginning early 20th century. And it just meant like Polish Jew. And there were some jokes, or like some characteristics of the Polish Jew being more emotional, which was connected to the way how Hasidic Jews are like praying, for example, and the Litvak being overly intellectual. So we can see like something similar that in America was between the Galiziano and the Litvak. But in New York, the, the term Polish did not catch. Um, they used the term Galiziano instead and developed like further basically. And why does this this case? I have no idea. Um, I suspect that just the Polish community was too big in New York and like defining yourself as a Polish uh, would be maybe in chal uh, like challenged by the other immigrant groups. I don't know, but um, it just didn't catch in like the popular culture. It was replaced by the Galiziano and also like enhanced by different various additional factors. Great. And here's a, a question about, about language and sort of uh, orthodoxy of language from Sally. And do you think that regionalism has been continued in that the correct academic Yiddish is actually Litvak? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Litvak won this battle. This is true. And like the high Yiddish, um, which is, I mean, it has something to do with Max Weinreich and uh, like the, the whole evil. Institute for Jewish Research, which comes from Vilnius, and they were the first to actually um, create a system, a catalog, and a, and a proper grammar. Um, so when I read newspapers, every Yiddish is completely different, every spelling, every sentence, and they basically put an end to it by making it. And because they came from Vilnius, from Lithuania, um, this is the Yiddish they basically established as the Klal Yiddish, as the Yiddish that is. Um, being used and as correct as you say in your question. Great. Uh, we have a question from Robin. Can you tell us a few of the major European towns of each culture, the Galiziana and the um, and the Litvak? Yeah. Uh, the um, major European towns. Um, so for, Gal uh, for Galicia, it was definitely the beef was the center of culture, uh, of Yiddish culture. And like the famous, um, it's like a famous troupe also in the beef that started to do theater. Um, then this is the largest, it was the capital of Galicia. Then we have Krakow, which was a smaller um, city, but it was the second capital. Um, but important little towns were, for example, Drohobych, um, Tarnów, um, Zolotchiv, where many actors are coming from, from this very little town. And um, for the Litvak, it was definitely Vilnius with the Vilna Truppe. Um, yeah, and, and then, I mean, it's then it's the larger pit of settlements. So the Litvak is usually like also including the Russian Jewish, and then definitely it's Odessa, uh, which has also a very huge role um, in East European Jewish history and culture. Wonderful. Um, I think everyone can see the chat, right? So we have uh, not a question, but a comment from Maxine, who says, my father was from Poland, not knowing anything about Galiziana. As I asked him, what would you do if you were Galiziana? And he replied, I would kill myself. <laughs> Strong feelings. <laughs> Strong feelings. Yeah, intermarriage was a very hot mm -hmm. debated thing, intermarriage between Galiziana and Litvaks. Um, um, any other questions for Oscar? For any undergrads who, um, would like credit, uh, if you look at the chat, the, there is a link there for Heal Life um, credit. 
but there but uh are there any other comments or questions for oscar then i think it's time to um to thank Oscar, we, uh, I don't know if every if everyone knows the reaction key. I, I always love that, but we can also <laughs> silently clap. <laughs> so, um, thank you for a really fascinating and very well illustrated talk. And you've got lots of thank yous in the chat. Mm -hmm. thank you. I also thank want you all. Oh, thank, thank you, Oscar. I want to remind everyone of um, our upcoming event. Um, on March 2nd. So we have a nice uh, slide there at the end that reminds you about the reception and jazz, jazz concert on March 2nd. Um, so we'd love to see you there. Otherwise, thank you again, Oscar, and we will draw this to a close. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>